Uh, I'd like to start the Westport Planning Board meeting for today, August, uh, I'm sorry, April 2nd. Uh, it is 6.02. Uh, we are being video recorded and video streamed live on YouTube and over the cable channel. Uh, first up, our administrative items. Uh, we have a pre-application consultation, file number 24-011-PAC, request by WEB Westport Solar, Zero Division Road, owned by Webb Westport Solar LLC, map 48, lot 12, between 663 Division Road and 757 Division Road to discuss a site plan approval for a proposed ground-mounted solar installation on 26.13 acres. Good evening, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I am Andrew Hamill, Westman Sampson Engineers with an engineer here on behalf of SWEP Development. With me tonight, I have Mr. Elijah Mendelson. Um, you stole some of my thunder. You read through a lot of what I was going to read through tonight. So um, it's my understanding that this was made available to you before, so please, if you need to continue on, I'm happy to go right to questions, um, so stop me at any time. So as you mentioned, we're here to seek preliminary feedback. Um, this project would be seeking site plan review and special permit as we would be located in the Residential Agricultural District. Um, as sized currently, it's two and a half to three megawatts DC. Um, I say that because there is a range of final panel that has been selected at this very moment, um, but that would be selected prior to full submission of the special permit application. Per the SMART program, BESS battery energy storage will be required um, as part of this since it's a project bigger than 500 kW. The ground pound would not exceed the 15 foot zoning on max height. The current parcel is generally isolated with forest area on all sides of the project, as you can see from the site aerial map on the front of the sheet. Um, as the chairman mentioned, the closest lot technically is 757 Division Road. It's what I believe to be the former Westport Air Park, um, just to kind of locate you within town right on Division Road there. Um, we do propose 11.6 acres of clearing within the project parcel under the 12 acres max dictated by the zoning bylaw. Um, and the topography of the site slopes gently from northeast to southwest. It's about five foot elevation change over 800 feet from the northern limit of work to the southern limit. The proposed site entrance um, is a 20 foot wide, 25 foot wide throat, which tapers down to a 14 foot minimum width. Um, we seek guidance from the fire department prior just to get what they would like to see. They said 14 feet and we were happy to comply with that. Um, they dictated that this would allow the fire truck to access the major electrical equipment, whereas a brush truck would be able to drive around the perimeter of the site. Um, they also asked if knock box, Knox boxes for fire department access would be provided. That would be spec'd on the sheet as well. A seven foot tall chain link fence per National Electric Code would be installed with a six inch gap above grade. We used to call that a critter gap, but we've kind of moved forward with just the six inch gap now. Um, the noise generating equipment is primarily located on the equipment pad. It's 200 feet from the property line and 800 feet to what would be the closest quote unquote structures. Um, as you can kind of see from the aerial here, there's a pool that I could consider to be a quote unquote structure because there were people that might be using it. That's 800 feet um, or the barn at the air park down to the south of the site. As proposed, it's a 25% stormwater design. We wanted to seek feedback prior to going through the whole process of doing full stormwater for the site. The groundwater elevations that we were able to pull say they're pretty shallow, so we have to go with a larger, wider basin as to hit our capacity. Uh, we do propose this in the southern portion of the site. A filing would be made with the NHESP. Um, only a small portion of the site, the site access road, touches a small corner of the habitat. Um, we would, of course, file with them either way, and we would provide that determination with the board. Uh, one of my colleagues would be filing with the Conservation Commission. We would file <coughs> online as riser poles and overhead wires would have to cross the intermittent stream as delineated on site. Electric utility requests a small gravel turnout. Turnout. You can see this on C203 um, and C204. Uh, that's just to get in and out for their equipment. It wouldn't be for the developer's equipment. It was something that the utility requested that be put into place just so a bucket truck could pull off the road and access any equipment they had on the poles. Um, 
through guidance from Amy as well, we listed the waivers that we would be seeking as part of this project. This is preliminary and might change based on the feedback we get today. As proposed, we would ask for a waiver from the 250 foot setback from Division Road. The solar panels would be greater than 250 feet, and the fence line is proposed at 250 feet. Um, you can see this on the site plan. The actually easternmost point would be just for the limit of work for shading purposes, and it would still leave 150 feet to Division Road itself. I believe it's C101 if you're looking for the overall site plan. Perfect. So this easternmost point would be the limit of clearing. And that would still leave 145 to 150 feet out to Division Road, which would be trees. We would also ask for a waiver from the large scale solar side yard setback of 100 feet and to use the residential agricultural setback of 10 feet instead <coughs> for shading purposes, as primarily there are no direct views from a butters as currently stands. Uh, again, just for stormwater maintenance, well purposes as well for shading. The waiver, we would also finally ask for a, a waiver from the requirement that plans show existing trees of six inches <coughs> up or larger, only for the sheer fact that we know we're clearing and it tends to completely clutter plans when you mark every six inch tree, haven't marked the site. A lot of them are dead or dying six inch trees for greater out there at the moment. We would, of course, anticipate making a full filing with all the requested documentation of 9.6.3 of your bylaw. However, we wanted to gain preliminary feedback and I'm uh, open to answer any questions that you may have. Uh, so, thank you for that. Uh, when you say you have a lot of dead and dying trees, are they all oak trees? Uh, I'm not a perfect arborist out there. I remember walking the site and seeing it's a lot of like wind blown trees, primarily because of the wetland areas located in this area over here, as well as some of the wetland areas delineated in this area over here. It's a lot of what you would see from recent storms or anything like that, kind of broken off halfway down. Uh, oak, not necessarily pine from my memory, but mm -hmm. that would be something that I don't want to qualify and upset the board with. And the areas between the butters or the road and the facility, do they have a lot of dead trees also? You're saying to this area? This area is primarily wetland species. It's like 30 to 50 foot trees in there. Um, it's tough when we get this much rain and stuff decides it wants to blow over. But this would remain entirely forested within here. Our limit of work would only come up to the swale line of the buffer. And uh, you have to clear further south of the panels than? We would. So primarily, we would hope to clear up to the side yard setback of 10 feet for what would be the res ag zoning buffer, um, not the 100, just because to fit that large shallow basin in there. There's no direct view from an abutter. Nobody lives on this parcel here. It's a big wetland to the south. Um, and primarily, you have to drive by it already. I drove it the other day. The adjacent owner has his trucks kind of parked there, blocking the entrance. If you were to drive on Division Road now to get a general idea of where you're going, there's two new grand pillars that he actually installed adjacent here. It's a completely gated access, so it's not like a public way or anything like that. It would be the southern owner who doesn't have a home or anything there. <coughs> So the location of the, the drainage basins, um, are where you're having the, the ability to have solar come through without trees, right? It looks like. Say that again for me. The location of the drainage basins. Or to the south? Yes, exactly. We have this larger shallow basin. It would be a solo basin down here. Um, again, just because there's no point in digging down to groundwater, right? You can't get any infiltration or anything off of that. So we have to do a large shallow basin to preliminarily hit the capacity of the site, pending your feedback. There would be swales that directed water um, that tends to want to run from east to west on the southern portion of the site and then direct it around away from the wetland to south on the western portion of the site.
So on this on this map, um, this big grayed area that looks like two stone walls together. What is that? Goes no all the way over here where it goes around the yeah. That would be the limit of work for the um, underground trenching. The utilities said that we have to interconnect off the Horse Neck Road. Um, so that's the current leased area from the adjacent owner um, and the road that they asked SWEB to potentially take should the project move forward. Um, it's actually open farmland at the moment until you get all the way out to towards Horse Neck Road. Yeah. So I believe that's what you're saying. You're going to tie into the existing utility pole. Yes, out on Horse Neck Road. What would be the inset of C204, sheet C204, would show you a blown up view of how we would get out to uh, Horse Neck Road. And we have preliminary feedback and pull layout from the utility of what they would like to see. All right, but from that point on, going in, it's supposed to be all underground. Yes, correct. So there would be a riser pole um, or a turning pole out off of Horse Neck Road here, and then we would transition down into what would be the utility-owned poles. But after that, we're proposing all underground. Now the utility-owned poles, there's still your poles. With, that's all underground. From from the interconnect in, once you get into the project. Yes, that, correct. That's so the, well, you just tell me there's poles there. We, we don't allow poles. You don't allow poles off of Horse Neck Road at all. No. So, um, I'm a little confused about why you go travel down Horse Neck Road with the interconnect for such a long distance before you connect. I believe that's the closest pole they told us we could connect to, Mr. Chairman. Um, that has the appropriate phase for a hookup. because we would have to jump across Horse Neck Road at some point, and that would be per final design coming from an electric utility. I don't want to speak too, too much to it because there hasn't been a full one line or three line generated yet, um, and that would take a little bit of feedback from Eversource. This is basically just the amount of poles and equipment that they told us they would like to see out there. So can you give me a better indication of where you are on Horse Neck Road? In terms of the number wise, I don't have a specific number for you, I'm sorry. Um, but out of off the Horse Neck Road, if you could potentially zoom in on the area. Why are the poles 25 feet apart? I believe that's spacing based on minimum spacing that every source would like to see. But what Manny's saying is that uh, the one pole that's uh, ever sources obviously has to stay, but the nine poles that get you to where uh, you move in an easterly direction, those nine poles uh, should give way to an underground uh, wiring, right? That's what yeah, ground, I mean. ground mounted equipment. Yeah. yeah. But you know, because poles every 25 feet, I mean, it looks like you're building a tall fence. Yeah, right? I, can, I can understand that. Again, we, we based this off of feedback that Eversource gave us of what they would like to see for equipment out there. Um, based on my experience, there's the customer-owned switches and then there's the utility-owned switches, and you kind of have to have both out there, um, is my understanding of it. We would propose, other than what you're seeing as this north-south primarily direction, I guess it's with the northwest to southeast here. This would be where the poles come up and that would be the location of the poles. There would have to be one turning pole here and then we would go underground all the way back out to the site until there is a rising pole um, for the interconnect up towards the site. We would come back above the ground. Yeah, but we, we've, we've come across this before. Okay. So we have an underground bylaw and so, so that segment continues underground until you get to the pole you need to cross the horse. Mm -hmm. And then all of the equipment 
What we're trying to avoid that the town is rural in its character. Mm -hmm. And then we have a bylaw which encourages, encourages solar development. We like to keep that either in former farmlands to help provide a supplemental income to farmers, or if they are in a site like this, they are hidden away from view. And these, this standard pole farm that they would like to have and have all the stuff mounted on the poles, it, it just becomes uh, you know, an eyesore in a town that we don't want eyesores. So we have, uh, we, and we've worked with Eversource that, that this can be all on the ground and you can do ground mounted, mounted transformers and all of those switch gear. And then, and then the, the only pole, the new pole that comes up is the one you need to cross the road. Certainly, so if I'm interpreting the board correct work with our source to see if there's any options potentially to move this underground and try and keep poles out of here or minimize poles to the maximum extent possible. Yeah. So Eversource, again, the, you're, they're gonna be owned in, in an easement by mm -hmm. Eversource, but you're the one that's building it. And our bylaw says it has to be underground. So Eversource, okay. obviously when everybody, whoever's paying for it would prefer to have it overhead, but we have a bylaw for it to be underground. You got it. So, so does this uh, require, this leg that you've got from the turning pole going south to the interconnect, does this, does this require clearing from the uh, right of way from the public road in a certain distance into the property? It wouldn't it necessarily be into the property, but yes, there would be some brush that would have to be cleared in that area. There's a wetlands over there, we would be mindful of that, and that's part of what would be proposed as the NOI when we file an NOI with the town. Well, is it brush or are there trees that you're having to clear to create this uh, well, that's underground line? Whether it's underground or, or a line of poles, you have to do a clearing along Horseneck Road, and it doesn't say how, what the distance is, but uh, it's, it's a considerable distance, plus this, uh, what does the Eversource call this little lay-by for their trucks? Yeah, just a little turnout for what would be a bucket truck. Well, it's not so little, I mean, it's, it's a considerable indentation off of Horseneck Road, and, you know, again, this would be quite a uh, departure from the current, you know, scenery, as it, if one would call it, along this section of Horseneck Road. Um, if you have to clear from what is the current road, uh, the, the right of way in inland, mm -hmm. east a little bit to to have this uh, this underground line. So I, I have a concern about that. Okay. and what its visual appearance uh, would do to the road. And it's a huge wetlands crossing, isn't it? We do propose um, HDD, HDD, horizontal directional drilling, for that portion so that there wouldn't be a disturbance. It'd be about a 700 foot run of HDD, where we would go underground. Obviously it would be underground up into the proposed wetland area, but it would minimize any sort of clearing out there, any sort of impact to the wetland as a whole. Mm -hmm. Except for along the road. Uh, Except for on the, where it's currently proposed, the board is telling me differently and to go back and work on it, but it's currently proposed, yes, we do have it coming above ground, and that's where the primary impact would be. And the, the property that you're going across here, is that the same property that you're Putting the solar panel on, or somebody else's property? That's owned by the Blumpachunk property, so it's old near field, and there's an agreement <coughs> signed by Mr. Gay before he sold the property to Blumpachunk, and he authorized the easement that ran along that property line that gets us to Horseneck Road. Okay, and what is this big gray line that's parallel almost to this? Electrical trench. Which page are you on here? Uh, C203. Okay. 
the thick gray line, um, this line here, Mr. Chairman, yeah. that's the abutting neighbor, um, their access drive to the north. When you calculated the area to be cleared, are you including this whole utility way? Yes, correct. It's 11.6 acres total. It's a full, full calculation off of AutoCAD. We calculated the limit of work. Right. And in your team, you're including the access road? Yes. <clears throat> the thing that jumps out to me is, uh, is this issue of uh, clearing inside the, the setbacks. The uh, number one on the division road side where this is supposed to be a 250 foot uh, solar setback, you're, you're clearing inside of that. And, uh, and you're also doing the same thing on the south side of this array where you're clearing right, as you said earlier, right to the property line. And, um, you know, I know you said, well, there's nobody living there, but you don't know that that may be sold someday and divided and there might be a house right there. The whole intent of this bylaw in providing these setbacks is that we, and particularly in the case of the road, we don't want we're trying to, as Mr. Dale was saying, we're trying to preserve what's left of our uh, agricultural image, as it were, and to see an industrial array of solar panels from the public way, from a road like Division Road or Horseneck Road, whatever. Um, the reason we're we're trying to we're trying to discourage that by uh, ruining that vista by having this 200-foot setback. So you're. I think you ought to find a way to, I mean, just my, my personal suggestion is that you find a way to avoid clearing inside these setbacks. Uh, they're there for, for a good reason. And uh, you're also doing it on the north side. You're clearing to the Mr. Mello's property line. I don't know how he feels <coughs> about it or who he is, but in any event, it, my point is that in doing these and asking for waivers to clear inside these setbacks, there, there are very good reasons why we require them in the first place. Certainly, and if I may, I think just pointing to the Mr. Mello aspect of it, it is the landlocked parcel based on what I've seen there. I'm not fully sure the full zoning of it, um, but it is completely forested as is. Obviously, you made the point of potential in the future. Um, we can certainly propose renderings or anything like that. I think that's certainly something we would provide for off of Division Road where we do propose potentially going into the setback just for clearing. As I said, that easternmost point where it kind of comes to a crux, there is still 150 feet of woods that would be left there. Um, so I think that it would be minimal visual impact off of Division Road and we can certainly discuss different options. Um, it's more to just gain the board's feedback on how they would feel about it since there's no visual impacts as is as what we're proposing to the project, certainly. 150 feet of, of woodlands left along the uh, Division Road, is that what you're saying? Yes, certainly, and that's that easternmost point where it comes to kind of that odd pentagon triangle shape. That's the closest point that you'd be able to see and again, there would still not be any solar in that setback. The fence and everything is still 250 feet. That's just for shading purposes as it yeah. is. Yeah. The purpose, and then I'll be quiet, but the purpose of having a full 250 feet of, of uh, vegetation is to provide really adequate screening from the road and an adequate green buffer. Would the board be amenable at that point to some sort of potential landscaping if we were to go in there, arborvitaes or something of that nature? I know obviously in this neck of the woods we hear about. That's the wrong word. Don't use arborvitaes. I'm sorry. Leland cypress, I believe, is what folks like to hear. Uh, the deer don't like eating it. Oh, yes, they do. Uh, <laughs> we do what we can. I do what the landscapers tell us to do sometimes. Um, but I'm hopeful that potentially the board would hear something along those lines. What, you mean inside of that cleared area? Yeah, so if we were to propose oh, potential yeah. screening along that fence line so that we could clear the trees for shading purposes to minimize the visual impact from Division Road. Let me put uh, Mark's question with his permission in a slightly different way. 
you know, when you ask for waivers, one way to think about it is what's the hardship that justifies the waiver that you want us to grant you? And the hardship isn't uh, justified by uh, the property line or the condition of your neighbor. Um, and as Mark said, you know, the setbacks are there for a reason. And uh, you can't create your own hardship. So, what is it? You know, if, if the lot is too small to do what you want to do, then you're trying to do something too big for what fits on the lot, and you should rethink what you're trying to do on the lot. Thank but, you but, but think about it. Certainly, thank yeah. you for being back. Don't try and put, you know, 10 pounds of peanut butter in a five pound jar, yes. and then ask us to help you with that. You wouldn't be the first, by the way, to try and do that, but. So, could be the elevation, but I, I don't see the purpose of clearing so close to Division Road where it but juts out, where the clearing juts out closest to Division Road. Primarily meant to follow the NHSB line. The rule of thumb that we like to use for quote unquote shading purposes is two to one. Um, so if there's a 50 foot tree, you want to clear to 100 feet out for shading purposes um, for solar production. I don't have any additional comments. I, you know, I do want to underscore the chairman's point or John Bullard's point that we don't often recommend waivers out of um, you know the, the particular regulation might be a little bit of, a, of an inconvenience or um, you know maybe a little bit challenging to meet the letter of the bylaw. But typically, what we recommend is that there would need to be some sort of demonstrated hardship in order to grant those waiver requests. So um, I just want to underscore what John had said. Financial considerations are generally not a hardship. Right. right. So, um, this is not a public hearing, but is anybody here for this that would like to ask a question or a comment? No. We do appreciate your coming in in advance. That's, that is right. helpful, and, and we do appreciate that. No, it's helpful to us to completely thank you for hearing me out. And you know, I'm hopeful we can get something into you guys and make it a nice, easy process down the road. That's what we would all like to see, I'm sure. So thank you very much for your time tonight. And what, one thing I'd like to just mention is that it would be very helpful if, as you're traveling, how, how long a stretch is it coming down Horseback Road? Um, just based on the 25 foot spacing and nine foot poles, you're talking 175 to 200 feet approximately. Right, it, even if you put it underground, it, I would hope that you could do it that would show little or no disturbance. That's, one, that's one of our best scenic roads and we don't want it, we don't want it mucked up. I'm also interested, you said that it was the Eversource who required you to go to Horseneck rather than Division Road, but we have other solar arrays, uh, large-scale solar on Division Road, so I wonder what, do you have any idea what their reasoning was? I, I can't speak to Eversource or the utilities. Sometimes they're creatures of their own design, yeah. I think, as any developer or engineer would tell you sometimes. A lot of times it has to do with the available capacity at the time or what the lines can take out there. So they do those studies on their own, and then they come back to us and say, you shall do this, you shall not do that. Essentially, is what we try to have to work off of. 
Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much for your time. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, next is uh, approval not required, ANR for 269 Narrow Avenue, file number 24-010A, request by the applicant for endorsement of a two-lot plan of land located at 269 Narrow Avenue, assessor's map 63, lot 8. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ms. Hardman, CDC. Um, representing the owner and applicant. Basically, uh, this is an AR plan uh, showing proposed two lots, lot one and lot two, both of which contain the existing dwellings on the entire property. All lots, uh, both lots conform, and uh, both effects in the front of the area. And um, we're seeking a uh, endorsement this evening. Um, so, uh, go ahead and look over the plan. Okay, so the, the entirety of the lot that's being divided is the one outlined on the outside? Yes, sir. Okay. It is currently one dwelling unit on one lot there's or actually, two? There's actually two dwelling units on it and a garage. Okay. Um, so this is actually making it more zoning conforming um, and the ability to, to sell each, each unit separately. Okay, so comments from the board? Questions? Planners? Um, so, lots one and two front on Narrow Ave, which is a public way that's certified by the town clerk. Lots one and two also have more than enough frontage to be considered for this A&R plan. And Narrow Ave has sufficient width and suitable grades and adequate construction to provide for the needs of the vehicular traffic. Um, he is correct that there are two houses on the current one lot right now in the garage. So um, dividing these into two lots does make it conform more. The only thing that I would that I would say is that currently from GIS it looks like there's one driveway that is servicing both of the homes. I believe that's correct. Yes. So, um, do you know that when they do, um, if this is endorsed and they do split the lot into two, if there will be an additional driveway on, on the other lot? Because Unknown at this time. Okay. Um, they have, I believe, a buyer for lot one in the existing house and garage. Mm -hmm. um, they want to go ahead and convey that. And um, I believe he is going to reconstruct the driveway. Service the existing life or, and or get an easement until such time as okay. that's done. Can, um, they control um, both lots one and two, so before it conveyance, they may retain an easement in order to continue to access. Okay. Which you're absolutely correct, yes. Um, both lots have over 60,000 square feet of area and over 30,000 square feet of contiguous upland, so that is okay. Um, the only comment I have on the plan is that. The zoning um, requirements have the um, the wrong minimum frontage on it. It should be 150 <coughs> feet, and then the minimum area should be 60,000 square feet instead of 80. <coughs> yep. Um, so I would recommend endorsement of the plan as it meets the intent and the, the it meets the threshold for an A and R, um, but just contingent upon a 
corrected mylar plan that has those corrected on it. You want a motion, Mr. Please. Chair? Uh, Mr. Chair, I move to approve the endorsement of the plan entitled Approval Not Required Plan of Land 269 Narrow Avenue, Map 63, Lot 8, uh, provided that the mylar is uh, modified uh, according to the corrections given by the assistant planner. Because the plan complies with the provisions of Mass General Law, Chapter 41, Section 81P. Second. Any comments? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank, you. Thank you very much for your time. Everybody. Okay. <coughs> uh, next up is Rosewood Lane endorse Form C1 and plans. Yep. So this was um, approved by the planning board maybe two months ago, maybe a month ago. Um, however, the Form C1 just needs to be signed and we have the plans for you to endorse. Okay. Do we need a motion or not? Um, we've already approved it. We've it's already approved it. It's just signatures. To sign those now or, or after um, the meeting? I think after is probably okay. best. Okay, while well, we're signing that, next up is Inheritance Lane. The applicant is requesting to release lot seven from the covenant for a definitive subdivision plan entitled Definitive Subdivision Inheritance Lane, Westport, Massachusetts. So this item was before the board at our last meeting for the reduction in charity and the applicant has brought that check in, so we have that we have the surety um, in the correct amount. Um, the applicant is just now wanting to release one of the lots, lot seven, and I had been in contact with Derek of SW Cole, and he has been overseeing that project. And since substantial work has been done, and the applicant is very. Um, forthcoming and in, in all the work that's being done and is in touch with Derek a lot, he um, is recommending that Lot 7 can be released and has no problem with that. Okay, are there any questions, comments? You want a motion, Mr. Chair? Please. Uh, I move uh, to approve the release of only Lot 7 from the restrictions of the Form F Covenant dated June 27, 2023, for the definitive subdivision plan entitled Definitive Subdivision Inheritance Lane, Westport, Massachusetts. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Uh, <coughs> next up is the 630 public hearing for 720 and 726 Old County Road, file number 24-03. SP-CD, the applicant is requesting a modification to the special permit common driveway. Good evening. Uh, for the record, Steve Giosa uh, with SciTech Engineering representing the applicant this evening. Uh, as was read into the record, this is a request to amend a common driveway special permit that was granted about seven years ago uh, for a piece of property located on the north side of Old County Road. And uh, as part of the initial um, project, this was a special permit for a common driveway and also an a &R special permit for flexible frontage uh, that created uh, there's a total of four lots that were created. Uh, the existing house lot with frontage on Old County and then this common driveway 
serving three additional lots to head north off of Old County Road into the project. Uh, again, it was approved as a gravel uh, drive, and as a gravel drive was approved with kind of a high point here, about 100 feet or so, 150 feet or so into the property, with a portion of the road, uh, driveway, common driveway, sloping back towards Old County Road, and then the balance of the common driveway uh, sloping into the site. So when you look at the original design plans and now you compare it to today, that same grading pattern has been maintained, uh, but again, the surface of the way was paved, so this uh, does require the applicant went ahead and paved it, did not realize there was a restriction on paving uh, of the, the common driveway as it was approved. As you always do, there was a paved apron at the beginning, and he carried that through to help with facilitating snow removal during the winter. Uh, thought he was doing a, a positive thing to help the uh, situation. The issue in particular in this case is, although we've gone out there on a number of occasions, I don't see the, the common driveway creating a drainage problem, but there is a natural low point here, which is about 500 feet into the property, is station 5 plus 0. So about 500 feet into the property, there's a low point. Uh, and there is concern about accumulating additional or excess runoff in this area. Um, there's also a sump pump discharge, which is located roughly here, which serves the dwelling to the uh, west of the applicant's property. Uh, that discharges to the fence line here. So that adds to a collection of water uh, in this corner. And so in order to um, hopefully have the, the board comfortable with approving the amendment for uh, allowing the pavement to remain on this uh, common driveway, what we are proposing is to install a Cape Cod berm on the west side only of the driveway, uh, starting at the high point, which is roughly here, and carry it all the way down to the end of the common driveway component, which is around L uh, Station 7. And what that would do is keep any runoff that does develop on the common driveway from migrating into that low point and get it down to a controlled area onto the applicant's remaining property. The, the natural flow from there continues for several hundred feet before it enters a wetland and the applicant owns uh, probably about another thousand feet of property heading in that northerly direction. So it's draining the water onto the applicant's property. It's eliminating any potential for road runoff from migrating into that low point that is there. We think that will at least address uh, the concern that's been raised to several town officials in this area. Uh, and we'll uh, hopefully allow the applicant to maintain what has been completed here. So uh, we did do some drainage numbers and you'll see that there's a, the difference between compacted gravel and a paved surface is almost negligible in a situation like this where we're dealing with a relatively short uh, amount of pavement versus compacted gravel. Uh, so that being the case, we don't, and I've been out here in a number of different rainstorm events, looked at water, how it's running off this uh, common drive. I have not seen any excessive water being directed onto abutting properties or elsewhere, but I think to solve this, uh, I hate to say more from a PR standpoint, but to solve the issue or the, um, the concern that the driveway is contributing to water migrating here, that berm would in fact allow the flow to be directed beyond that point where it could not then back flow into the um, little low point there. So we're looking for one more modification to the common drive to allow a Cape Cod berm to be installed and then allow the applicant to maintain the paved surface. And I'll be happy to try to answer your questions. So Steve, um, if I recall this, of course it was <coughs> seven years ago. Uh, there were issues uh, halfway down this driveway with the Butters property to the west, whether or not this driveway, as it was proposed, was going to flood their backyard, if I recall. Yeah, in fact, I, 
came out here and I think I met with the neighbor, I don't know if it's the same landowner, but I did meet with somebody who I believe was the adjacent landowner in that location. And we did, we did identify that the abutting property is very flat. Uh, there is a pump discharge to this location from the abutting property. Their flow actually enters my client's property as opposed to the other way around. Uh, so there's always been that concern from, I think, both parties, but yes, that was something that was discussed early on. I think, again, the berm is something that would, I'm not sure it really is necessary, but we think we had to do something to hopefully address this concern. It is a continuous slope down, so we wouldn't be creating puddles in the common driveway. There's a gradual slope all the way to the end, and the discharge point is on the applicant's property. Um, so we think that that solves the problem um, without getting into any uh, extensive regrading or removing of the pavement, which we don't think would accomplish any uh, net benefit at all here. So have we had this looked at by a consulting engineer or not? Um, so we have not uh, because the applicant, um, I had sent two emails previous to him. I had sent him emails stating that we needed more money for the consultant review and he has not been in contact to give that to the office that's needed. And so therefore the consulting engineer will not review the project until we have those funds. Okay, and it's the opinion of you two that we need that in this case? We need, yes, because it's, it's dealing with drainage. Um, and so we need we need field engineering to look that over. Okay, the, the copy of the plan I have here, uh, the contours are so light I can't see them. So it's hard for me to determine. Um, all I remember is there was a big discussion about this uh -huh. seven years ago. Um, it would be my opinion that we, we need to get the consultant to, to double check your calculations okay. um, for the benefit of everybody. So I don't know what everybody else thinks. Jim, I think I agree that we, we should have a, our consultant review this. But for my own information, this lot on the west side that's designated lot 47F, and it shows their address as Rachel, Miss Rachel Trapp. So, do I assume that that lot has frontage on this driveway, common road? No, the, the common driveway easement is actually this strip of land here, this heavier dash line up to these lots. So yeah. this is the common driveway. This land is actually part of this lot here. So no, this, this property to the west has no frontage, there's no road here. It really is just an easement, and that easement does not come all the way to the property line. So where is the easement goes from this property line to this heavier dash line that you see there. So the that's the extent of the easement. The property where the driveway is belongs to the far house. You see the dotted line, that's the easement. And the driveway is in the easement but that property belongs to the far house. And the far house is the applicant's property. And can there be further subdivision? No. This, no this is the extent of any subdivision. What happens is once you get just beyond this house, probably another 150 feet or so, there is a vegetated, pretty extensive wetland back there. All right, thank you. My inclination is it's possible that it's okay, but I'd like to see the, right. the consultant engineer concur. All right, we'll, Steve. we'll get the consultant piece right away. Mr. Yeah. Chair, does, does the whole road pitch all the way to the, to the back? Yeah, it's, it, there was a high point here, so this portion as originally designed and as constructed does pitch back towards Old County, but from here, and this actually sh sheds down into the the driveway here, but from this point to the end, it's a continuous slope all the way down with 
with no low points in the in the driveway at all. Okay. So, so they could they could if they if they figured that they needed to dump the storm water okay. back to that well and be well. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, so this is a public hearing. Uh, anybody here for that would like to speak? Please. <clears throat> So what we'd like you to do is identify who you are or where you live. Yes, my name is Ron Solomon. I am the owner that we are discussing to the west of Mr. Rad's property. Okay. I am the individual who has been here year after with uh, the concern for the amount of water. Uh, I have had to install pumps in my yard. In this last week of rain, I have had 13 inches that has gone to the foundation and started to enter the house, unless those pumps are on, which is pumping water into, <coughs> I'll say the gully, because I don't know the appropriate term, where when construction of that road originally started, mm -hmm. and I came here to present it, there were drains put in that at that time were not in the plans, were not approved, was then concerned about what grade the plastic was and why they were there and how it happened. If those drains were lower, they would be taking the water off of my property. Mm -hmm. So right now, if again, I'm not an engineer, but if you're looking at the road height, which was lifted from the natural elevation, there is a gully and that water is and has been currently trapped. I've lost all my bushes. I've lost several trees, and at that point now, when the water gets to about six, seven inches, it is flowing opposite way. It exits my yard down through a berm, into the driveway, down a, almost like a river. It is flooding the street as well as a neighbor's property as well. So I voiced it. You folks have pictures that I have submitted of the pumps on and how it looks like a, a whirlpool sucking that water out of that property. In any given day, in this amount of rain, that yard is completely, completely flooded from foundation to property line. That has never happened. I've approached here several times. I've worked with several people here, whether it's, you know, wherever. And I'm here today to say that it is still a problem, and I'm looking to resolve that matter somehow. Can you point to your house on there? I am on number two. From here, I cannot. I can help if you want. Sure. This is a low point. I think your house is probably right in this area here. Okay. So, you know, looking out, you can see we've said that, that there's a natural slope to the property. Again, you know, neither here nor there. We know that road was never supposed to be paved without drainage appropriately put in, and now it's paved, and that was my concern. And when I voiced it, it has brought us to this point, probably back in November or December, where a letter was submitted to gain approval. The pictures you folks have, I've got a dozen more of water like a river. My driveway is starting to collapse. I've lost. If I say 20 shrubs and bushes, I wouldn't even be on the low side of that. Um, it floods Miss Rachel Trail, which is a hazard for the younger children that live on Miss Rachel Trail, as well as the vehicles traveling down there. And the neighbor's house is nearly completely flooded, whereas they have to pump their base of their driveway themselves to get to a natural drain. So it's pretty so, much the So you're saying flood. that this, this floods from this these properties across no I'm sorry across this roadway across, across this Rachel area, Trail and into through your property or your neighbor's property into the properties on Miss Rachel Trail 100% that water looks like a stream coming out you can put a canoe in it and go down it and so your property is on Miss Rachel Trail, right? Correct. Okay. I built the house 20 years ago. We never had that problem until the property in the back was taken over. And 
obviously two homes put on. So did you have the problem before the two houses were built? I've or never had a problem with water. We've had, you know, playground sets back there. We've had to take them out. Uh, everything that's there is destroyed. We had a fire pit back there, two of them. They've had to be removed. All the shrubs have had to be removed. Now I'm losing trees in my driveway because of the amount of water. Yeah. It's eroding all of the mulch. This goes back to you know, quite a while. Where Gary Bouchard uh, tried to resolve the problem, put drainage down the property line on the street. It just does not take the water enough. It's like a pond back there. And in your opinion, do you think uh, this, the Cape Cod berm would keep the water on the property? Or? I do not think so. I believe at this point in time that that water in my property needs to be diverted into that drainage easement, whatever you want to call it, that's the low side. I'm true to believe that that was the original intent when they identified there was an issue, and they did put trains in. Again, never asked for permission, never got it on the plans, never did anything, and no follow-up on it after I presented it here. We will look into it, we will look into it, and it's never happened. So there were drains put in there. I would say they're six inches higher than the water level. So until six inches hits that pipe, the water is staying in the yard. Okay, thank you. Was, thank there, you. Uh, was there a problem before the road was uh, paved? I would say that the water was still coming there. I do have pictures of that, and more than happy to present them to you in a second. Um, I have, since that was developed, there has been a problem. That road is clearly much higher than the property. So uh, the reason I ask is that the applicant is coming for, for relief from having to return to what was originally a condition that is paving for the first few feet and then gravel. Uh, if we didn't grant relief, he'd have to go back and return it to gravel. Uh, my question to you is if it were returned to gravel, would that solve the problem for you? It would not solve the problem. I think that the asphalt on top of it is definitely added to it, but it has naturally flowed. If we went out there tonight okay. and watched the video, so you would if, see if it. Our engine, if the engineer that we hope to get hired is looking for how do we solve the problem, returning it to gravel isn't necessarily a solution that solves the problem. No, I would, again, not an engineer, okay. but my theory is appropriate drainage that would have kept the natural okay. flow down instead of building a road right. up. So the applicant is proposing a berm. In your idea, that doesn't solve the problem, but I think everyone here is, is trying to focus on what is it that solves a problem. That's my intent yeah. to solve a problem. This is going on. I've got to worry. We want to go back to the original. We're trying to figure out how do we solve the problem. You say that about the farmland and everything yeah. else. That's going to be okay. my kids' house someday for them to deal with this and what we've lost at this point. Okay. Thank you. Well, thank you, folks. I'd like to see you. Yes, please. Who is next? My name's Ken Silvery. I live on one Miss Rachel Trail. And uh, I don't know exactly the extent of what's been going on in the back there, but I, I live across the street from Mr. Solomon's house. And since this project's going, been going on in the last two years, my driveway, which usually gets flooded in the beginning of the driveway, which is probably about a foot or two, is taking on about 10 to 12 feet of water. And now my driveway is starting to get eroded because of all the water that's coming off that property. So just want to make you guys aware of how it's affecting the whole neighborhood. Can you so. point out where you live, please? Well, where is Ron? Where are we? Ron is at the one highlight in there. This is Ron right here, right? Beneath it. Oh, right here. Yeah. So my property is right here, so the water runs down and across into my driveway right, right here. And like I said, it used to be like one or two feet, but it wasn't too bad. But the last two years, I'm getting like 10, 12 feet in. Can't even get to my mailbox. This, this year, I actually slipped 
almost slipped the disc in my back, falling on the ice because I can't even get to my mailbox anymore. So. so that's flooding the road? It's flooding my driveway, Your driveway. And, and my property. It comes so across it, the road, Miss Rachel Trail. Exactly. It's, up, it's almost like a, a stream coming straight down and right across into my driveway. And obviously that has some structure to do with the road, the way it was built with the push out in the past, but within the last two years it's gotten much, much worse. So thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, to figure out I'm the owner of the property. I'm the applicant. Okay. Can we can we get something on the driveway to, to show what the issue going on? Okay, so this property here, the uh, the gentleman did not mention here. There's a trough <coughs> inside this hole. This this driveway here is about two feet higher than this area here, which is all these trees planted to provide some privacy from the neighbor, from this side. And there's a fence alongside here. There's like a, a sump pump here that discharges water onto my property. And all the water, when it rains, there's like a trough that runs alongside this whole thing. And this area is lower then there. So the water can't go to this gentleman's property. The water goes straight all the way across and there's a brook alongside there, this wet area there. So all the water that goes on the driveway, it runs alongside there and it goes all the way to the end. There's no water that comes across. Nothing. You can go there anytime. You can see there's 30 feet. There's trees here. There's no signs of water that can go across. None. Okay. I have I have this this one here, the, the the sump pump here. This land for this gentleman is very flat. All the water that stays there is the water that's that's produced by the sump pump. There's no water that goes from here that goes to his property. The water from my property goes all the way to the end. Nothing goes across. So what I really can't tell from the contours, they're so faint. The, the water would normally go be going from the lower right across your property? The, the driveway here, basically, this is 20 feet of blacktop. Then there's 30 feet of like dirt. Most of the property here, like the adjacent property, is higher. So the water can't go anywhere except a, a small area here. So is, but, the, is the driveway higher? than the surrounding property on both sides? Yes, the, the driveway here is about maybe about 20 inches higher than, than this area here. And how about the area above it? Uh, in here it's higher. No, above it. The Where's lot. the ceiling? To the east. East yeah. of it. East. It's on, right. on your property. Right. This way? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's about level, but there's troughs on both sides here, so the water on either side goes across to the other side. It doesn't go across this way. So w what I'm trying to get at is, does the when you put the road in, you put it in as gravel to get to the two houses in the back yes. that you built. Was that higher than the surrounding property on both sides of the road? Mm, no, it's it's about level with with this side, but it's higher than here because this property is actually lower than than this whole thing. Okay. His property line is lower than here. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So, I still think we need a uh, consulting engineer to look at this problem and see if we can get a solution. So, yeah, I think if you if field engineering is who you rely on for this, yeah, they're obviously very qualified. So we'll we'll um, get the required deposit in, get that review, and get back in front of you and see what field has to say. Um, and again, I, I, just to reiterate, the sump pump issue is something that goes back prior to this development. So, because I remember going out there, having it pointed out to me, actually by the neighbor, you can see the staining on the fence. That staining has been going on for many, many years, and that discharge predates this development. But we'll, we'll get a, hopefully a read from field and reach a solution that hopefully addresses Mr. Solomon's problem. 
um, if we can, but you know, at a minimum, make sure we're not contributing to it. Thank you. And some, uh, Steve, some photographs of this site would be. Uh, would yeah, be I've taken helpful. pictures in the rain as well, so I do have photographs from my site visits over the last six months. So yeah, we can do that. And, and we'll have the engineer take a look at the site too. So we need to have a motion to continue yeah. this hearing to a future date? May 21st uh, is what Amy said. That's 645. So, uh, Mr. Chair, um, I would move that um, we uh, continue the public hearing for uh, 720 and 726 Old County Road uh, to May 21st six, at 645 uh, for uh, the purpose of um, having field engineering uh, assess the drainage situation uh, with an eye towards uh, determining not just whether um, uh, the paving should be removed, but what solution should be found for, for paving and drainage. Second. All those in favor? Uh, aye. aye. Very good, thank you. <coughs> okay, next up is uh, the 645 public hearing. For Sewell's Way Solar Project File Number 24-004 SPA-LID. The applicant is requesting low impact development site plan approval located at 0 Sewell's Way, map 57, lots 19 and 24. Good evening, Mr. Chairman. Um, good evening to the, member of the, to the members of the planning board. I just wanted to introduce myself uh, on behalf of the applicant. I will hand it off to Atlantic Engineers to review the actual site plan this evening. Um, but I wanted to introduce myself. So my name is Pierre Journal. Um, I work uh, for CBE North America. Um, we have multiple projects that are operating in the state of Massachusetts. Um, and I recently joined the company a few months ago. Um, I think it's always important to put a face to a name, so I just want to take the time with my colleague Stephen Engelman, who I'll hand up mic to in a second, um, to just introduce ourselves. And so I'll hand you also my business card. If you have any questions, um, happy to answer them this evening or, or at a later date as well. What did you say your name was? My name is Pierre Journal, P I E R R A. Pierre. Yes. Stephen? Yeah, sure. Good evening, uh, my name is Stephen Engel, I'm here with CBE North America on behalf of the project. Uh, I've been a project manager on this for uh, a couple of years now and uh, we're just here to kind of uh, present details that you've seen previously uh, with some, some updates based on some feedback that we've got from the planning team. So uh, I'll hand it off to Atlantic Engineering here who's been working on the project uh, for longer than I have. Okay, so before you continue, I just wanted to continue the introduction to this. This application was previously approved on January 25th 2021. Due to utility interconnection delays, the site plan approval was set to expire in March of this year. This site will be assessed through an existing 40 foot access, through an existing 40 foot right of way off of Sewell's Way with access rights given by landowner of lot 18D to expand the easement to 50 feet to meet the frontage requirements. This will be a 3.99 megawatt AC or 4.99 megawatt DC solar array to include 13,668 panels with gravel road access. Okay, great. <coughs> Good evening. Um, Rich Tabazinski with Atlantic Design Engineers. And um, as you, the chairman had described, uh, we've had this project in front of you previously. Um, it obtained its original approvals, both a special permit uh, for ground mounted solar and a low impact development site plan review. We received those approvals back in uh, 2001. 
Um, just recently, the special permit for the solar development was uh, extended uh, by you uh, this past February in 2024. So um, in terms of the two permits or approvals that the sport has, has granted, one, the special permit has been extended uh, through, through next year, um, but the LID site plan review approval um, needs to be I guess, reinstated or revisited, and that's why we're here in front of you today. Um, but the plans that you, that you have in front of you, um, along with the application package and the narrative, is basically uh, the same as what you've seen uh, in the previous versions uh, several years ago and on, on which the approvals were granted. Um, the only changes we've made to the site plan and design have been to address any of the conditions of your approvals from, from three years ago. Um, there's a, a section in your narrative, um, section five, which is basically an explanation that goes through each condition of approval and explains how we've addressed those uh, that relate to the plans themselves. Um, but there's been, so th those are the only changes to the plans that we've made. Um, the, and, and they really relate to um, just several minor uh, addendums and, and changes to the drawings, such as some screening, uh, some limit of clearing changes, uh, additional uh, stormwater infiltration trench. Um, so there, I believe there was about four or five related to the plans that we did address on the drawings that you have in front of you now. Um, but in terms of uh, the stormwater design calculations, the whole reports that were originally submitted, uh, those haven't changed. They were thoroughly peer-reviewed peer at the time uh, by SW Cole, and they were reviewed again, uh, this time around, by uh, field engineering. And so we have received <coughs> a, um, some comment letters from your department heads and from uh, field engineering in terms of your peer reviews. We, in looking at those, they're pretty minor uh, comments that we, we can address with some minor uh, changes to the plans. Um, and they, that relates basically to um, preparing a separate um, erosion and sediment control plan. We have erosion and sediment control design and guidelines and, and details shown on these sets of plans, but uh, field engineering feels it'd be better to have that on a, on a separate drawing sheet as opposed to just incorporate it into the grading plan. So we can easily do that. <clears throat> um, there was a, they've noticed a discrepancy between the planting plans uh, versus the, uh, the site plans. So we'll clarify that discrepancy in terms of the number of trees that are being planted. Um, the other ones related to uh, in a stormwater operation and maintenance plan, they only wanted to see that signed by the owner. Um, so we'll get that taken care of for you. And then a couple other conditions they, they, they suggested for an as-built um, and for a SWIP be, to be prepared during, during construction. So we'll easily agree to those other items. So addressing your peer review comments would be very straightforward. The fire department also has several comments that affect the plans, mainly the turnaround um, that's in, in between the two arrays located in this area here. Uh, they just requested the geometry of that to be changed, um, to be lengthened and the radius is made a little bit bigger. Um, so we'll uh, make those changes on, on, a, on a revised set of plans. And, and take care of that for them. They also wanted some notes added regarding uh, some more specifics on the signage and knock box that's being provided at the gate entrance. So um, again, we feel we can address any of the comments that were received by the department heads um, and the peer reviewer with relatively minor changes. Um, so, I can run through 
a full set of drawings and calculations, if you like. But again, I think we're, they're, they're basically the same as what you've seen before. It's just uh, trying to get the LID permit kind of reinstated, if you will. So I'll, I'll open it up to any questions. Anybody have any specific questions? Yeah, specifically, um, thank you for addressing the issues that were brought up by the uh, field engineering and their peer review. One thing that confused me a little bit is uh, our Conservation Commission's comments because they, in the printout I have, they, they say a couple of things. They say that the wetland line is no longer valid. And then they mention, they recommend that more stormwater measures be considered. Uh, it's our opinion the project may cause adverse effects to the surrounding buffer zone. But beside that, then there's a letter in here from them dated right. March 4th, which says it's fine. Go ahead. <laughs> right. Well, that did lead to some confusion on our part also. Um, but w when we had originally submitted the plans to the town back in 2020, I believe, we had an, an ANRAD completed that uh, basically had the wetland line reviewed by the Conservation Commission, and they accepted the line as it was. Um, that we then went and designed the project to stay outside the limits of that buffer zone and didn't need their conservation commission approval. So the, the issue is, is that in red only lasts for three years. So that has expired also. Um, so to, to uh, have the wetland line officially and approved by the conservation commission, we, we would have to file a new and RAD and get them to officially look at it. But in light of us have going through that whole process, the conservation agent went out and looked at the line and he's, he said it's not gonna change. It's very straightforward and the line that we show on our plans is fine. So I would think for the purposes of this review, um, I think that we're, we're satisfying the conservation commission in terms of where the wetland line is. We just haven't officially gotten the, the whole commission to, uh, to accept that. Uh, but we feel, and his, the agent feels, that there isn't going to be any change to it. Did he uh, reiterate his recommendation that more stormwater measures are to be considered? I, I, the second letter only addressed the wetland line. Yeah. Um, the other ones um, we feel we can address by responding to the Conservation Commission um, with references to our prior calculations. As I said, there is stormwater measures on, they're, they're talking about the southern array, uh, this one here. Um, there are stormwater measures that were put there. It's not a uh, detention basin like you, we have on the northwest corner of the project. It's an infiltration trench. Uh, that will um, mitigate any runoff from that southern array. So, uh, and the stormwater calculations that we did, um, including all the watershed plans uh, and the pre and post development analysis, water quality calculations we did, all show that we comply with the DEP stormwater management uh, guidelines and the LID. Uh, guidelines of the town um, so we honestly don't think we have an issue there um, in terms of that southern array the majority of that land slopes away from that wetland area Thank you. Uh, the, the majority of this prop of this area right here slopes in this direction not towards the wetlands mm -hmm. so we have a, a stormwater measure on that eastern side, there's none on the western side, basically because there really isn't one needed um, from our opinion and I think from the opinions of your peer, peer review engineers too. So we'll, we'll respond back to the Conservation Commission with those type of explanations on why we feel it's appropriate as designed.
was it on the uh, the report from the engineer on this particular project or something else that I've read recently? And I'm sorry if I'm screwing it up, but there would seem to be a question about the erosion from the dripping uh, off of the panels. Was that something? That I believe was another comment from the Conservation Commission in their in their comment letter, and again we feel that. The, the panels, the lower edge of the panels, which would have any drip that is, they're only going to be two feet off the ground. Um, this isn't a, a canopy project that's over parking lot where they're right. elevated eight, nine, ten feet above ground. So, and, and the whole area beneath the panels is going to be um, seeded with a meadow mix so that it's not just going to be like a grass or anything, it's going to be a pretty high grass meadow in underneath there and so with that combined with the fact that we're only talking about a couple feet off the ground uh, in our experience there really isn't a major issue with um, drip edge drainage from a, a ground mounted solar facility like this. We've seen it occur on, on uh, the canopy projects but not on a smaller scale uh, ground mounted uh, version like this. So. Again, we were going to basically explain that in our response letter to the commission and uh, go from there. Okay. Uh, any more comments? Can I make one more comment? Sure. Uh, it's, this is along the lines of what we, uh, you heard at the previous uh, uh, application, the pre consultation application. This issue of um, clearing inside the setbacks. And uh, I know that whatever it was, we did get approval for this. Um, I made exception to that. I, I still feel strongly that um, overall, report after report say that clearing, you know, siting solar arrays in woodlands is not a good idea. Uh, that woods, in fact, serve as a tool for water management. They provide shading. They provide climate benefits such as carbon sequestration. But, so we can't here on this board, we can't say you can't build here. But um, I do think that asking for waivers to clear inside the this is like the uh, previous application is a small area inside the 250 foot setback from Route 88 um, mm -hmm. is, is not a, a good idea. You could, you could reduce the number of panels and pull that retention page inside the setback or outside of the setback um, and that would avoid and that would provide this full 250 foot buffer zone. Because uh, one of the arguments that was that I read in here was that well, you know, Route 88 is uh, well, it, it is 450 feet from the nearest solar panels, mm -hmm. uh, the actual traveled way, but uh, but the right of way is, uh, and that's what we're talking about is being set set back 20, 250 feet from the right of way. We have no control, again, it's the same sort of thing. We have no control of what will happen in the future. I would say almost certainly that road's going to be widened someday. So that it could be that the travel way will no longer, part of it will no longer be 450 feet. Uh, so there's a good reason to respect the, the bylaw which uh, requires a 250 foot setback. And, uh, as I said, you could do that. I know you'd have to give up some panels, but that could be done. And the same argument I would submit, I would make in uh, where you're asking for a waiver to, on that southeast corner, to uh, clear, instead of 100 feet from the property line, to clear 50 feet. And uh, the argument to do that was that, well, it's just another solar array on the other side. And uh, it's, 
But again, that solar array may not, I think you own that one too. So. Uh, but the, the day may come that that solar array is no longer in service, it's, it's uh, decommissioned and there might be a house lot there. So uh, I just think it's important to, to keep, it's, it's only 50 feet, but to keep this full 100 feet of setback that's not clear uh, would be important. And again, I realize you'll have to lose a couple rows of panels, uh, but um, I think that uh, that that these waivers, I, I don't find them to be. I'm not. I'm, I don't find your arguments to be compelling, and I think we ought. To, uh, myself, I think we should uh, stick with these. Uh, ask you to comply with these uh, existing bylaws and uh, come back if you want with a revised plan that would eliminate those waivers. Mr. Chairman, if I may, the, the waivers that are being discussed right now were waivers that were approved under the, the special permit and the special permit has been extended. Um, and so what we're looking at um, here with this resubmission is just the, the site plan criteria. We, can't make amendments to the, the special permit that was already extended a number of months ago. Mr. Chair, yep. um, did he get a waiver for the overhead? There the wasn't a requirement when it was approved. No, it was always a requirement. What happened is someone yes. slipped through. Three years ago. Yeah. And that wasn't a requirement. Yeah, we still have the underground electric pilot. Yeah, it appears that the waivers they, were, they had received from the Special permit were setbacks from the street lines, clearing and trimming within the required 100 foot setback, and then some requirements for submitting a photometric plan and provision for water, neither of which were necessary because it's not included with the proposal. That, that's kind of what happened over here on Main Road when those poles popped up, and then they told us, well, the utility company requires us to do that. That although they remain utility owned equipment, it still should be underground. So I, I believe that. These I, I don't think that our bylaw requires underground. The, the underground part of our subdivision control is one thing. I think this is not a subdivision. So I don't think it, it pertains to that. Although I would like them to put those underground. I mean, I don't know. I think it does. I think that was what our, what our question was. The, like, the provisions for undergrounding, too, that, that's a component of the special permit review? Well, I know that. Um, so. I think they can be encouraged to underground the yeah, electrical I mean, equipment. So, not you, but these two guys should consider putting the, the connection underground as much as you can get to the pool, pole that goes to the street. Because, especially since it's on a residential, a real residential street, not, not on uh, Drift Road. So, yeah, I don't think that it's a public road, though. I believe it's a private road that just services these homes. Yeah, but it looks ugly as hell. Understood. I mean, especially for a, neighbor, a neighborhood, because it's mm -hmm. going to be in a small neighborhood, uh, and it's going to look ugly as hell. And we don't allow it today, but and we'd like you to be good citizens and, and put them on the ground. I don't think it, I mean, it's uh, a big ask. So. Are you clearing for the access way? No, that, that, that's already, it's already a field. Yeah, there's a there's a cart path that runs in. But on both sides of the cart path are the trees. So. Oh, it's, it, need, it needs to be wide. Yeah. But, um, but what I'm trying to get at is that the pole line is going to be in adjacent to trees. There's already there's a pole already. line there on the road. Yeah. There's a pole line that comes down so this way that feeds all the homes. That's the that's the. I area. understand that, but I'm talking about your driveway coming in. Okay. But I, I kind of disagree with the chair that, that we, we don't have to put it on the ground. It was because of, when we determined it after this happened, um, it was based on, they were saying the utility company required us to have it. Oh, no, but it still, it, it, it was approved the way it is on the plan. Yeah. Uh, and we re approved, we continued the approval okay. a few months ago when they were here before. But I would hope that they could consider just doing it to be kind to the neighborhood. Understood. Yeah. Certainly, we try to do that. And, and, and Mr. Chairman, I would just uh, add, I, I really disagree with my colleagues, but uh, I, I, I 
reviewed all the original materials, the drainage materials. I, I know the site well. I, I did many of the inspections on the adjacent uh, field. And uh, having voted to approve this and having the special permit be in existence, I, uh, uh, I think this is, this is uh, nothing to do but uh, you know, to uh, approve this as, it, uh, as we have approved it in the past. But with the same token, I would say, uh, there are only a few homes off of Sewell's Way and there's, there's, there's quite a nice home almost directly across from this. And, uh, and uh, I live in the neighborhood. Uh, and so anything you can do to uh, reduce impacts to my neighbors is appreciated. Thank you. How will they when when the, the last one? Because I think one of the conservation's questions on the dripping. So we've had we've had trouble with them establishing the meadow underneath the right. so so if you guys were really good at that, that would help too. Okay, yeah. and and we um, and, and my my colleague and uh, Mr. Soles and I have spent some time in in, in the chair in, in looking at these as. As these projects get built, uh, this, the site of, uh, and I think this is mostly to the engineering, uh, I'll, I'll try to keep this brief, but, but there needs to be care during construction. It, it, it seems, you know, this idea that the, the solar panels can follow the contours and all of that. Um, but, but essentially, all of these submissions have the existing conditions, you know, and, and those are the contours that you show here in the plans. Mm -hmm. And the site is, is a, a, a hardwood forest, all, all second growth, but mature trees. In the, in the site clearing, and in just the pure mechanics of uh, grubbing the site and all that kind of stuff. And then, um, you know, the logging operations with skidders dragging the, the, the trees up. Normal construction stuff. What, what we've discovered is that, that uh, particularly uh, like in a site like this where you're at the crest, and a lot of the reason that there isn't uh, uh, stormwater management on the uh, eastern side is that is that most of the solar power is draining in the other direction. Um, just out of that construction, we found that um, the the in quotes existing contours don't get to be put back. Mm -hmm. That once it's cleared and then the solar panels start going in, there really isn't. Uh, a secondary check to go back and look at what the grades are. Can we round this off so that the the assumptions you made in the drainage design, mm -hmm. that is the water is flowing in this direction down the contours, um, you really need to look at them after you take that initial site prep. Are, are the contours really going in that direction, as opposed to, no, they're really flat or we've created a saddle. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we've, we've had a, a, some trouble with, and we've, you know, we've held people's surety money, and uh, is that there's been enough little rutting created that doesn't get washed out, and that you plant your, your natural, in, in, and frequently, we, we specify a, a flower mix to get open space to, to have some ecological function. And what happens is you buy this expensive seed and you throw it in the ruts, and then they stand full of water and the seed doesn't work. Mm -hmm. right. And you know, next thing you know is you're back here explaining why the seed didn't take and we're saying, well, you know, he, 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 it's, it's like, uh, do you, do you want a good garden? Create good soil. Right? Mm. That's, and, and you need you need to do those kind of things. I, I, I didn't mean this to be a lecture, but it's it, it's really 
care that it makes a difference. And it's, and it's not, it's not uh, money. This is this is not a significant impact on the construction cost. It's just after you do after you do the uh, the the logging and the clearing and grading. You know, spend a little time doing that site grading so you make sure that the stuff that you're going to build is, is mm -hmm. going to work. You know, we're not, yeah. We know the electrical side works. You know, we, we know we we know the sun will shine on the panels. Does does the site work? And mm -hmm. and that's that's just a a, a caution that it, out of the the lessons we've actually learned doing inspections, not to penalize the developers, but to have them to get out of the loop of, oh right. no, you're gonna come back next spring and seed it again. We don't, we, uh, we, it, it's, a, it's a board that tends to be business-like. We've got the regulations, we follow the regulations. Uh, and, and we just don't wanna spend time chasing people to do what they should have done in the first place. Understood. And not to be a little bit long-winded, but we've learned mm -hmm. from some of the past things, you know, like the things with the pollinators. I, I mean, that came before us where we had a situation where the stuff didn't grow and now trees started growing. And, had, okay. and we can't, we're not letting them use pesticides or whatever to kill the, the trees, and we had that issue. And then we learned from that same person that the pollinators, if you plant it, you need to plant it, let it go through a frost for it to take. So it was different things like that. Mm -hmm. You know, we've had some real success, but we've, we're have learning along the way and we'd like to give it sure. out to you guys. Yeah. Yeah. Understood. I think that we can condition the approval of the site plan to require a, um, them to reconfirm that the, the stormwater yes. is accurate before they put the panels up. Yeah, uh, and I think that's a... Mr. Chair, that's a good idea. That, that when when that site prep is done and can you get it logged, you know, to get back out there with uh, with a gun and make sure you know where the right. road is going. I think your peer review engineer had made the same comment. Um, item three, they basically had proposed that an as-built uh, grading plan be done. Um, once the site is graded, to make sure the site is graded properly to the stormwater BMPs and that the BMPs have been built properly too. So yeah, I, I believe that that's yeah. what we require today. Sure. This is a new application. We, all, so, all of our applications now so, absolutely require that. So we require you to do that and submit it to us or to our consultant mm -hmm. engineer before you get a uh, building permit to put in the panels. Mm -hmm. You know, we definitely would accept that as yeah. a condition. Absolutely, we appreciate the feedback on that. Um, and you know, as uh, uh, as Mr. Dio had mentioned, it's really it doesn't add a lot of cost. It's really about kind of finishing the job and finished grading part at the end, uh, and then planting and seeding and landscaping part. We've done that earlier in the project. We're happy to you know, continue that on this project. So we, we hear you, and we, we, we certainly will take that. Good. Good. Save it, Mike. That condition is actually was included in the original approval, so it is then. Okay. Any more questions? Anybody in this audience? Yes. Um, okay. I think I'm probably the most effective of all the people here, since this is my property here. Okay. Could you please identify who you are? Uh, Penny Hatfield. Okay. Sixteen fifteen Drift Road. Okay. Could you speak to the microphone so everybody can hear you? Uh, anyway, I have. Are you folks CBE? Correct. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Your this corner of this array here is 25 feet from the fence to my to my property 25 feet no trees planted i don't even see drainage dishes but this spring i had 
quite a few dead trees, compliments, and it was a mild winter. Apparently, uh, herbicides sprayed, but trees that have survived for 20 years, dead. I have 100 down in this field here, right here, this array, there's 110 blueberry bushes. They've practically been eaten by 23 deer who now live on my land. And what do you think this is going to do to my deer population? They've either got to be culled or we've got to stop planting side by side solar arrays because the deer have no place to go except to come and eat my plantings. And I've got an agricultural tax liability and my land is on a conservation restriction. I've done all I can. I've got a gravel driveway, 650 feet. I have farmers who hay my fields and this is all blueberries. My old Christmas tree planting, this was, we had five fields of Christmas trees. The deer have eaten up to as far as they can reach when they're on their hind legs. They pull the branches down and chomp away. They're desperate. There's no place for them to eat. There's no place for them to live. I, I you know, it's, it's really frustrating. And this, this solar array here is right downhill from my vegetable garden, which is here. <laughs> Where the wind blows, everything goes. And I'm, I'm really, I'm tired, I'm tired. I fought, I fought this for a whole year. Wrote letters, talked to you guys, and there it is. And it's right up to my, this is my woodland right here. <laughs> you know, I'm 84, I'm not gonna live to see too many more of these, I hope. Thank you. Anybody else? Any more comments from the board? Planners? I, I recommend the approval of the of the site plan low impact development um, because it was approved previously, um, and we've already extended the special permit for this project out a year, and they they meet the intent of our bylaw, and they satisfy the low impact development purpose and design standards. Okay, you want a motion, Mr. Chair? If there's no more comments, sir. Uh, the first motion I want to make is to close the public hearing for uh, Sunrise on Sewell's Way, LLC. Can I say one more thing? Yes, ma'am. Have you, any of you seen pictures of what happens to a solar array when a hurricane hits it? There was a huge solar array down in Puerto Rico. It was hit by a hurricane. The panel shattered. What, who's going to clean up the mess when something like that happens? I would hope the people that own it. Yes. Mm -hmm. They have a decommissioning obligation. They have obligations to clean up? Yeah. At the end of 20 years or whenever they... Yeah, at the end of 20 years or when they stop using it. Mm -hmm. I won't be around to see it probably, but... <laughs> I, mean it not, a, I mean it, not either, right? <laughs> it would be a good sign to see it gone. <laughs> Okay, so you made a motion. Do we have a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, before I vote, just a comment that I guess I erroneous, erroneously assumed that uh, a uh, low impact development site plan approval, uh, that in such a process that we could <coughs> consider the waivers, and uh, you pointed out, Michael, that. You cannot because 
they're in they're baked into the special, special, permit. Permit. special, special permit. permit and I did not know that uh, maybe next time you'll give me some warning and I won't give my whole tree hugging spiel. <laughs> we appreciate it. But, uh, but it, was, it was okay. Yeah. But um, with that, I uh, I vote to approve. That that's well, we just a, mo a motion to close the hearing. Mark. Oh. <laughs> okay. But you can you're give right. it twice if you want. <laughs> well, then maybe I won't. <laughs> So, then I entertain a motion. All right, you want another motion? Please. Uh, I move to approve the site plan approval low impact development application for Sunrise on Sewell's Way LLC for property owned by uh, Daniel Perry, trustee of the John B. Hathaway Real Estate Trust, located south of Sewell's Way between Route 88 and Drift Road, assesses map 57. Uh, lots 19 and 24 pursuant to Westport zoning bylaws, September 6, 2017. No, that should have been eliminated. It's the current zoning bylaw. That was the current <laughs> zoning bylaw, Article 20, site plan and low impact development subject to conditions. And I want to parenthetically say that Amy said that those conditions include what we talked about in terms of uh, making sure that after clearance of trees is done that they reassess uh, site plan. So those conditions include that. Uh, as the plan, uh, back to the motion, as the plan presented reasonably meets the intent and purpose of the low impact uh, development bylaw by reducing the adverse impacts of soil erosion, sedimentation, and stormwater runoff. Did you get that motion? Yes, I think she did. I, I second. Any more discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. That's five? Yes. Okay. Thank you. We well, thank you very much. Appreciate the feedback. I have the board business presently, but if you need to reach out to us, so just don't hesitate. Yeah. Okay. That's all right. Well, going back to New York? Back to Boston. I saw 27 or 3 New York. I noted. I, I, noted. I, I, sent the the one. I sent the one out that you sent me. Okay. <laughs> I guess I printed yeah, they off make the version that I just... You're canceling. <laughs> yeah. Of course. Yeah. I, just, I just came in Okay, next is the assistant the planner's report. Um, so, the reports included the review for the solar and also the a &R. I just have one update on coastal healing. Um, I believe back in December the board voted to extend the time for coastal healing to do the work within the Route 6 corridor, the little patch, and March, it was extended until March 31st of 2024. And so March 31st has just recently come and gone, and the work within the Route 6 corridor is still uh, not done. So I reached out to Diego, and he's stated that he spoke to Jim Hartnett about this and that his Mass DOT curb cut permit has been extended until the end of the year and his other permit is valid until July of 2024. Um, and he's waiting on a few more quotes from companies that can come, and come out and do the work. And so I asked him for an extension request for the planning board, and he has provided us one. So that will be on the next the next meeting. Um, but just as an update, um, it should be done soon. If it's not, then we still are holding $25,000 in surety, and we can complete it from the highway if okay. needed. I think, I think uh, Mass DLT went out there. Recently? Yeah. So when I, I'd given 18 uh, 
a number because I did. There was a Mass DLT um, across the street. There was a complaint um, from somebody putting storm water into the drain, so they were out that way. So it looks like there's gonna there's a couple of property owners that have a little bit of an issue going on over there that they gotta fix. Uh, so I have another stormwater issue on a project that I did about eight years ago down the other end that Mass DOT's causing a problem, so they're looking to fix that. So there and there's actually a new person in charge of the stuff out there, so yeah. I think you're gonna start seeing a little bit of action going on. So I know they did go over and looked at that. Okay. Hey, Michael. Planner's report. So I circulated an email with all of you from Serpad, and they're looking to help the town apply for a one-stop grant. And we've talked about a couple of different deliverables. One could be a town-wide economic development plan. So you know how to strengthen some of the industries that already exist in Westport and looking forward to new industries, um, especially with the Route 6 sewer project. Um, real estate build-out profiles, creating a permitting guide for the town, promotional and marketing materials. They did some work for Fall River, so if you have the email in front of you, but that, that's one option. Another option is um, looking at the entirety of the route, well, I guess not the entirety of the Route 6 area, but from Route 88 to the Dartmouth line and getting a long range plan together for those areas in part to inform, well, to inform future zoning in those areas. So they had done previous work between Fall River and Route 88, so this would be a similar type of project just on the subsequent section of town. So those are two options. I wanted to get feedback from the board on either of those options. They are looking to, I think, hoping, um, apply on our behalf so this to the one stop program. Yeah. Both of them, or either of them. I think they would probably prefer that we pick one or the other. Um, but I, if you, I can ask them about picking both. We already have the one for 88 to, to Colton Narrows for development. I'd be in favor of going the other way. 88 to Dartmouth? Right. Yeah. But I don't know what everybody else thinks. Yeah, I'd yeah. be the Okay. In the DLTA, nothing. Do we have anything going on? That that did come through. They they're going to work with conservation to update the open space plan, and they're going to start working on that. I believe Chris said Chris Capone, the conservation agent, said that that was going to start in June, and yeah. So we did we did make out for that one. Okay. And the only other update I have is on the Quickshan River Rail Trail extension. This is something I applied for a Mass Trails grant, and that's still outstanding, but I initiated the process to get this on the Transportation Improvement Program. So I met with SERPED and MassDOT last week. They're really supportive of it, uh, even though it's a smaller scale project. I guess SERPED is looking to support some of these uh, key linkages that are smaller in scale. You know, because this would probably be a two million dollar project, and some of the projects they support are much, much larger than that. Um, so that the project need request for this was approved, and so now I'm going to work on the project scope, working with to get that submitted for further review. Okay, and would that be coming to our railroad white right away that goes between the two hotels? And yeah, there are some issues. Yeah, there's some issues that need to be sorted out with the rail right of way because it's currently leased to a private property owner um, from Mass DOT Rail Division. So that's something that would be that would need to be sorted out. The tip pro process takes you know, four, five years, so 
there's some time to to work that out. Okay. That's it. Okay. Correspondence. The main correspondence we have is a letter from the Climate Resilience Committee that has a series of policy recommendations um, uh, for East Beach following the winter, the, the winter storms, southerly storms that hit East Beach pretty hard this year. Um, this is following some public engagement and some meetings that, that, that uh, we've had different stakeholder groups from the uh, from East Beach come and talk to the Climate Resilience Committee and the Planning Board and so there are those seven recommendations there. Um, I can read them if, if you want, although I know a lot of the board is fairly familiar with these. Well, I seem to have two different versions of this. Oh, sorry. One has John Bullard's signature on it yep. and the other one they're the same model, though. Okay. So, uh, you've worked on a draft report to the select board from us, which would include this, right? It will but include. It's not, it's not done. It's not. It's not done. It will include this. It'll include an analysis of existing conditions. The types of um, the types of predictions that are available for sea level rise, coastal erosion, mm -hmm. things of that nature draw a lot on the East Beach MVP study as well, and it'll also outline the town's dif differ differing um, permitting obligations or regulatory obligations, I guess I should say, because it's not all permitting. Um, and then that'll be submitted to the select board with the planning board's recommendations at a later date. Um, we'll probably need to have a, a dedicated agenda item on a, on a future planning board meeting for that. Right, and one of those options is to get a, man a, a management plan. But mm -hmm. that's, that's a long-term thing. We can't wait for that. Mm -hmm. That's part of our recommendation. But, so, I guess the, the, the issue that, that has come up is that if we're going to send our recommendation, uh, it, if we're going to work on our recommendation and then send it to the select board, that's going to take some time. There may be some of the things that we already know that we should transmit to the select board because they're going to be dealing with the new applications for this coming season already mm -hmm. and dealing with um, the cobble that's on the, east, on the East Beach town property um, and stuff like that. So it's on their agenda. Uh, when, Manny? I'm not sure. Coming up? It's, yeah, it's on their agenda on the 22nd. 22nd of April. Of April. And it's just this this letter. So it's, yeah. you know, it's, it's not the, the planning board's recommendation. It's just the, the letter that was sent from the Climate Resilience Committee. So I leave it up to the board. Should, should we try to hammer out a short letter to the select board saying that the main report will be coming, but these are a few items that you should address right now. Anybody? That would be fair to give them an, an update. I mean, I'm, I don't want to speak for, for the different board members, but there has been a bit of a lapse from when the select board initially reached out to the planning board and climate resilience committee for, um, you know, for, for this report. And so would you know, it wouldn't be a bad thing to reach out and give them an update. I, I would think that would be an excellent idea because my colleagues seem to are in the belief that this stuff all takes time. So the sooner you get it to them, the better. I think that, uh, you know, uh, Jim and I and Bob are on the Climate Resilience Committee, and so uh, we have participated in the uh, 
hours and hours of discussion that have been held through the Climate Resilience Committee with a fairly wide uh, a group of constituents. Um, and that's reflected in the seven recommendations uh, that the select board uh, has now. Um, and the select board will chew that over. I, I don't know whether they will just say received and put on file for debate at a future time or whether you guys will want to get into it on the 22nd of April. That's something that you can figure out on the 22nd. Yep. I think that the planning board should set aside uh, a meeting to talk about this, uh, just ourselves. Uh, I don't think necessarily that we need to go through another set of public meetings because we've had a whole bunch of public input. I, uh, but I do think uh, because we, you know, it is complicated. There isn't a silver bullet. There's a lot of issues. There's debate about what facts are. I think that we should set aside some time, not, you know, at 8 o'clock in a meeting, to really think about what's the best short-term course, what's the best medium course, what's the best long-term, and how does short-term help you towards medium-term? How does medium-term help you towards uh, long-term? And so, uh, I and I think there is information gathering that Michael can do in the meantime uh, to help us with that in terms of sea level rise projections, storm frequency projections, things like that. Yeah, so I, I, I agree with you, John, but the, the things that I was thinking about are things that <clears throat> really have to do with what what the problems are today. Yeah, the and short term. So the really short term, because uh, the process of issuing permits is going to start or already has. Um, and so one of, I'm just going to throw out one of the issues that, that we've uncovered is the town bylaw that allows trailer permits. Yeah. Uh, says that the permit shall expire on June 30th. And the form that they have everybody fill out is for the season. And because it's a town bylaw, you cannot waive the requirements. So they should be aware that they really have a problem. Maybe they can do something at town meeting this year yeah. to, to change that. But it really, for, from a legal standpoint, uh, that's really a, a big problem. And number two, I, I think that the town, as they're issuing permits, should have some way to determine whether or not, uh, because the continual erosion of the lots, and not that all of them, or even some of them, but some of them may not have enough room for a trailer today. Right. And so we shouldn't be issuing a permit when there's no possibility of them putting a trailer on the property between the town right away and the high tide park. Right. So um, those are the two main things. And, you know, I don't know how the town can do that, but there's it's their responsibility to come up with a way to do that. And perhaps you could ask uh, applicants to stake out a place for the trailer on their lot that could be inspected by the building inspector before the permit is issued. And they also, the town bylaw says they have to meet the area requirements for a lot. I don't know what 
that means because the lots are all old. They don't, I don't think there's maybe one or two that meets the 60,000 square foot requirement. And does that mean the area that exists or the area that exists on paper where the property yeah. goes into the water? I don't know those questions and they should be asking town council for these. Answers. Yeah, but someone can also say, well, it does mean that as long as you put my sand back, you know, if you put enough sand back, I'll have enough area and we'll get into an argument with people. Uh, but because we're going to have that problem, doesn't yeah. mean that we shouldn't right. try to solve no, the I know, I know. And I think that's where you're right, that there are short-term issues regarding that where town council mm -hmm. uh, it, it's imperative. It's it's going to have, have to give earn his money uh, in terms of helping the select board out in uh, refereeing the kind of arguments that we can all foresee. And, and, and the town has not only uh, 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 you know, the permitting obligation to the owners, but it, but it has its own obligation. The road is very rough and difficult to pass bullets. If we have summertime traffic, uh, it's it's almost one lane. You know, and in, in, in places it's unpaved, and in other places it's only one lane remaining. Um, the town beach parking lot is is full of cobble piles, and is not graded. You can't, you know, if, if, if at one hand. In, in the town hall next door, they're issuing beach passes. On the other hand, they're not. You can't, can't park there. You can't. You can't park there. Right. You know, so it's like, well, how is that going to work? Yeah. Uh, so the, the the town has, you know, is, is it in the is it in the budget to to do the road? It's you know that it, it would have to come from chapter ninety whatever it is that we get money from. I think unless yeah. we get some kind of grant. From to, to fix it. But so there's, there's uh, I, I agree with, with John that uh, we, we need a workshop and I think we should, you know, at least raise these issues with them. There, these, this is not some complex engineering issue, this is a common sense issue. You know, the, the road is not, it's barely passable. It's a town road. Are we going to make it passable? I think there's plans already to fix that. What you saying, man? I think there's plans to fix it. Yeah, to fix it? Yeah. So, it, the other issue is uh, the, the requirement the town has a bylaw that accepted the FEMA floodplain and the FEMA floodplain, the FEMA regulations with regard to that, which uh, from Michael's input, from his experience in Ohio, uh, you must have a system where you are administering those regulations. We've already approved them, so they're part of the zoning bylaw, and we're not doing anything. And if if FEMA, if we had a big disaster, and everybody was filing claims for flood insurance, not just on East Beach, but everywhere in town. Yeah. Uh, they could say, okay, well, let me see what you're doing. And if you're not doing anything, we could be suspended from the system. And which would mean that nobody could get flood insurance or they couldn't get mortgages for areas that, that are possibly under flood watch. And so we need to have the town address these things in the right way. So that, I don't know who's going to do it. It could be the building inspector, but the building inspector is going to do all this all over town. It's not just East Beach. It's almost everywhere in town. It has flood possibilities. 
if, if you look at the flood maps, oh. they're big. They're, they cover so, they cover big chunks of the entire day. And so, you know, if everybody has a not everybody, but most people have a mortgage that's insured by FDIC or whatever, not FDIC, but the, the, all these things can be a real problem if we don't address them. I mean, and the problem is we are now aware of them so that we have to address them. That's one of my, Mr. Chair, so that's been one of my dilemmas. We've been trying to, you know, we did put aside some money for an engineer. Mm -hmm. And we're trying to move forward with creating a department of public infrastructure. But for some reason, nobody seems to want to put it on the warrant. And I guess, I don't know why Chair from the Infrastructure Oversight Committee I think it would have been his job. For some reason, we can't get it done. And uh, but we do have a municipal light plant going on the water. And I don't. I mean, I don't believe I was told in the meeting that I should have put, put this stuff together. But I, I think uh, I think KP Law probably did the municipal light plant. So I, I I don't know if we can move forward with some kind of motion or request to. Select board to have KP Law draw up a warrant article for for, for a department of public infrastructure. I think it's, I think for the next town meeting it's, good. it's too late for this one. I, I don't. I think if we can't do that, maybe we could ask KP Law if it's too late because I don't think it is. We just have to have a meeting. If they draw it up. Just have a meeting of the select board. Except, I just. So with all the things we got going on between East Beach and Route Six, Trunk Line, so what? Um, yeah, I, I agree. With, I agree. We're going to need one. Yeah. But I think we still have six months to a year to figure out. That. Uh, I don't know about that. I, you get the FEMA stuff. You got You know, they, you know, we had the woman talking about the hurricane. You know, what it does the solar panels? Um, I don't know. Uh, I did. I did get from the chair of the select board that these things take time. But well, they they were trying to get a DPW several years ago, but what they intended to do was just make the highway department the DPW without any more help, and that was kind of that was a no, <coughs> no. It, there's no way that, that would make any sense. So. Uh, you really need engineers, but you know, I think we're getting away from the question of yeah. what do we tell the select board. So should we have a when's your last next meeting? The one coming. Monday. There's Monday. one. Yeah, there's one next week on Monday, and then the one that the, the CRC letter is on for is the 22nd. So the second meeting is one. So, Mr. Chair, wait one second. So perhaps we should have a, uh, a work session to discuss this uh, before the, their meeting of the 22nd. Because that's when this is going to be on, 22nd? Yes. yes. They're not going to review it on Monday? Well, they don't have it yet. This this letter is on their yeah, agenda. This letter is on their agenda. I, I they, they sent it to the board. town administrator already, so and yeah. he's confirmed that it'll be on the agenda. I can also make it, um, you know, if there is a work session, and we get something over to them, we would have to. If you would like it to be on the same agenda, we, we, the, just the work session would have to be before. Um, I believe they like to have things on Wednesday, eleven a.m. Yeah, the Wednesday prior to the meeting. So we would have to have it before April 17th. Okay, when's our next meeting? April 23rd. So is there a after their meeting? So is there a consensus that we could have a, a work session? For next meeting? Yeah. Uh, yeah, what day, 17th? Yeah, that, that would be the last day to get something together. I'll be away, Mr. Chair. What's the 16th? It's 
says we have a meeting on the 16th. Is that right or not? Mm, that's the date on the No, the 23rd is the is yellow for a meeting. Well, it depends on how we look at it. There's either both of them are yellow or none of them are yellow. <laughs> you don't see it. Right. So what days are you I'm available? I'm uh, going to be sailing in Grenada from uh, the 12th to the 22nd. Can we have it there? Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, you could all come on board as long as you bring some rum. Yeah. <laughs> I think this is important to, you know, bring the issues to the select board on the 22nd. So, uh, even even the absence of uh, our valued colleague, uh, maybe the, <coughs> at least the three of us we get a quorum for a work session. Yep. On the 16th or 17th. We have to get the thing. It would, have, the it would have to be the 16th. The 16th. Uh, uh, I think I can do that. I can do the 16th. Yeah, I'm, I'm just back on the 15th, so yeah. Okay. Yes. 16th? No, I'm, I'm, I'm all booked up, so you got, you got enough with him, or right? you need me. Okay. So the 16th at what time? Uh, work sessions are usually at four. Does that work for you? Six, six to four. Four. If four. I can make it, I'll make it. Yep. Okay. Just gonna be easier though. Get it there. So, you wanted to say something, sir? Yes. Um, I was hoping to interject a little bit while you guys were discussing the uh, seven points that were going on at the CRC. And I know that time has lapsed since the storms hit, and while well, we've thrown this around a little bit and had our various meetings, we've got input from CGM, DEP. Could you somebody the microphone? Yeah, tell sure. Say who you are. <coughs> Hi. Thank you for uh, giving me a moment here, Kevin Kurt, East Beach Improvement Association President. Um, like I was saying, you know, we've been uh, working with this now three months, three months plus, if you go back to December 18th. And um, there are some issues, as you guys acknowledge yourself, you know, short-term goals. And we've proposed a couple of short-term goals that would obviously help us to protect the beach and protect that part of the road that's vulnerable, solve the problem you guys discussed in regards to the town selling beach permits and people having nowhere to park because of mountains of material, etc. cetera. Um, at the last Board of Selectmen meeting where I was present, I had a discussion with the chair and the various members, Manny was present, and um, there was a general consensus that that material at the town beach could be brought back to solve two problems. Give the town its residents its accessibility to park there because now they're parking on private property. All the properties that you said are in need of nourishment because we have to worry about sizing and et cetera. So the discussion at that meeting was can we take that material and bring it back to the most vulnerable spots of the coastline we have areas on that road that are seeing more vulnerable, more vulnerability in washover that didn't see that just since those past three storms. So something that's critical, something that we may first is fast approaching, the permit process for those landowners is already in place. That material that could be brought back to shore up those most vulnerable areas of the road 
and give the people the opportunity to do what they can with their properties and reach out to bring in the proper approved material through conservation to make their lot usable as it was in 2023. Items one and two or two and three in the resiliency study, in the CRC recommendations address A, the road clearing process, which would put any material back where it came so this doesn't happen again. And B, get that other material off of Tom Beach, the mountain that was put up on Gooseberry, well, I say mountain, a few truckloads, and at least give us a starting point to help with the various problems right there in the short term, protecting the road, renourishing the beach to some extent, helping those property owners that have very little to work with at the moment. Yeah, I understand that, Kevin. Uh, then, the, the letter from the CRC is already in the, uh, mm. the uh, office over there at the town hall. It's, it's, we have no way to direct anybody to do anything. Here. We're not in that business. Uh, they, they have the letter. I'm sure they are aware of the problem. Yes. And they can, they can do that if, they, if that's what they want to do. I, I've been in discussion, and we are on the agenda for next Monday. Right. On the, on the agenda for not only um, the uh, removal process that we're hoping to bring up mm -hmm. and maybe get a vote on, in addition to possibly um, getting that material brought back. Now, um, I know you guys talk about the CRC letter for the 22nd. Mm -hmm. My thought process, and I don't know if that's a possibility, but can a portion of that CRC letter be structured or, or be emphasized in such a way by the planning board to say, we'd like to address these two items in the short term? Because May 1st, people are going to be starting to utilize that property or at least have that opportunity. They may not be able to utilize it on May 1st, but if we can get that material back and subsequently nourish from other sources, whether they take it out of their pocket, that would be your short-term solution. So that's just a suggestion that I have that I thought after conversations <coughs> with select board members would be something that could be considered tonight, or at least recommended, recommended by Michael, and, and in, you know, presented. Because I'll be there Monday. I've had a discussion with Chris Gonzalez as well, and um, I think he's waiting for direction from the select board. So um, I don't know that it's going to do any good for us to tell the select board what to do for this next Monday, I don't know. But um, if anybody wants to make a motion to at least put that in a short letter before we get going. I think that they're gonna have to move the cobble out of the parking area anyway. The question is, where do they put it? They either put it back on the beach right there, or they put it in front of everybody else's place. And I don't think it's much of a difference to the town, which which way they do it. Um, it, it I know is valuable you, to I us. Think I don't think it's much of a difference in cost yeah. for the town to do. Um, I was so. I had offered to help coordinate that process with Chris, etc. The town once it's decided. The big, most important thing is if you people use that term loosely, if someone can make a decision. I'll help coordinate where it goes because I know who needs it most and I know the most vulnerable areas of that road. Well, does anybody feel like we should write a, a short note to the select board with regard to the, the cobble that exists on the town beach? Uh, you know, <coughs> the, 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 the problem I, I, I have with the they have to move it. It is one thing that the town bulldozes it back 
uh, on the town beach, in front of the town beach, and levels that. Right. I, I, I don't even know if the town has the authority to do that. You know, the, it's all coastal wetlands. Is anybody got an order of conditions? And I know, I know the board members have have uh, emergency orders, but <coughs> you know, there's a town doing that. Then there's what you want. Can can a public agency take take the material? I, I know it washed off the sites, and I know it wrote, washed in the road. I know what that issue is. Can they pick it up? And they picked it up and they put it somewhere. Okay. Now can they take it back and and, and put it? They didn't take it off the lots. Nature took it off the lots, and, and then they did something in the public way. You know, if, you know is, is it our recommendation? Of, I don't. I don't care what the regulations is. I don't care what the law is. Just go do it. No, I don't think. I, I, don't, I, I, I for one, will not vote for that because I don't know. I don't know what what that is. If if there's if there's no problem with the town putting the material back on the lots, um, uh, you know, I think if there's no material cost difference. That's that's one thing. And the question is, can, can is is that a recommendation we should make? So I, I think that what you say is been swimming around my head all the time. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't think that the town has has the obligation nor the right nor the permission to put it onto private property. And but I, I do think they could put it in the town right away in front of the lots, which is what they want. I don't know and what we do with it otherwise. And, and and that's one of the motions I voted for that motion yeah. to say, well, listen, if we, if we have a storm again like this, don't truck it away. Just make a pile on on the street line. Right. Take the material, make a pile on the street line. If some of it falls on the lot, so I'm, uh, I'm not fussy about that. But there's a big section of of town property in front of these lots. That's in the right way. You can see where the yellow stakes are. There, you know, there's, there's, you know, 15, 20 feet. Yeah, the next overwash. That should be the strategy. Pile it back there, and then the owners get to, 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 to right. whatever they get a permit for, they can do. Right. And and that's that's different than than. Oh, yeah. Take, I, taking it off the top. I, I, would, I would suggest the select board has the information in this letter from the CRC that Kevin just mentioned in terms of priorities about uh, short-term needs. I, I don't think they need any underlining or yellow highlighting from the planning board. We've spent since six o'clock dealing with requests from all over town about things that affect setbacks, drainage, all kinds of rules that we try and apply fairly all over town. East Beach can't be the Wild West where no rules apply that apply to the rest of town. That we just do things uh, by the seat of our pants. So I think that we've got to take time and think about East Beach because clearly uh, what is going on there is not going on in the rest of town. And if there are bylaws that have to go before town meeting about setback requirements or other things, then 
some thought has to be taken about what makes this a special uh, case because we spent a lot of time on uh, 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 VRBOs because we know it's been happening for a hundred years and it's part of the character of Westport but they're not legal. So we have to make them legal and we have to make sure they don't get out of control. And it's very complex how you do that. And it's gonna go before town meeting and we think we've figured out how to do something that's always been part of the character of Westport, but it doesn't happen to be legal. Now we hope it will be legal and it'll protect the character of Westport. Just the way East Beach and the trailers is part of the character of Westport. How do we make sure it stays legal, it uh, protects this with <laughs> of climate change? That doesn't get done, you know, winging it and saying, go do this, go move the uh, cobble and sand. Uh, I, I think the select board can do that in the short term. They can direct uh, Chris to go move stuff in the short term, but we've got to figure out how to do this in a way that uh, is legal and respects what happens so that this is the same as would happen in any other part of town. So people in other parts of town aren't saying, well, what do you mean? I can't have no setback, you know? These guys are all getting special treatment. I don't get this kind of treatment. So I, I think we've got to take a little more time, but I don't think that has to keep anything that you're talking about, Kevin, from happening. I just think the select board can direct all that stuff without us thinking about it. But I think the planning, the planning board has to think about what are the rules that have to apply here that you can go any place in, in town and say, these are the rules that apply in East Beach and they're rules that we can stand up in any part of town and say, these rules work for, these are Westport rules, not East Beach rules. Does that make sense to you? Yes, it does. It reminds me of the 2010 uh, judgment from Judge McGuire when we had a back and forth lawsuit and he had made three arguments in that injunction. And one of them was that you couldn't treat East Beach any differently than you treated the rest of the town. I can't go word for word of it. I don't have it in front of me. Yeah. If you guys researched it, you could look at some of that validity of, of that statement. But um, at the end of the day, you know, I respect the fact that you know, equal and fair treatment for all, that, that's the, the way it should be. In a circumstance like we've got, we are in a little bit of a precarious zone. Yeah. You know, I know you made the, the change the zoning a little bit. You had to satisfy FEMA, so on and so forth. Um, but I think in, in the interest of keeping Westport the way Westport is, yeah. um, some effort towards that resiliency, which we've talked about at the yeah. CRC, needs to happen. And I'm only looking for a couple of short-term solutions while we work towards those long-term goals yeah. that you just discussed. Yeah. And I don't think that's too much to ask, yeah. even if it's just a, a recommendation or, or, or a letter from Michael saying, hey, you know, uh, or if he just worked with the chair to try and, you know, get, get something moving. Again, you know, we've already missed the April 1st deadline, which, you know, deals with the national heritage. So now you've got May 1st fast approaching. Some of those people on the south side probably won't have the opportunity to enjoy the full six month length because they've got a lot of work to do. Okay. But this is an effort to try and help. Yeah. Because we, also, we all yeah. want to save the infrastructure. That we yeah. get another bad storm and the road gets hit and wiped out in the middle, 
not so much where it's damaged, but where the water's washing up in that area between address 106 and 142. If you've driven by, you've seen the piles of seaweed. We get a bad one, that road's gonna buckle right there, and then you're not gonna have a road. So, I'm trying to do the best I can to satisfy our community and still try to bring something to the table for the town. Yeah, good, thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> so, um, I have two sets of correspondence things here. Uh, so on one sheet we have the climate resilience, and on the other sheet we have chapter 91 of Patricia Kent on Drift Road. There's, there's a handful of items that in the correspondence that um, re really they, they ought to be listed in the agenda. We can go over them. I mean, it's, there are a couple of Chapter 91 notices. There's a notice from Dartmouth about uh, rezoning, you know, administrative things of that nature. Okay. Well, can you fill us in on what all these things are just quickly? Yeah. Okay. That's the East Branch there. Yeah. That's yeah. where Bob lives, right there. Yeah, that's the, the pile up <laughs> there. <laughs> that's that's my house in that mountain over there. Yeah. <laughs> that mountain is sinking. Chapter ninety one notice for this for the dock on Drift Road. So do you know that, uh, I told you this before, that between Hicks Bridge and the Fontaine Bridge, or the Route 88 Bridge as it's called, which is about four miles, using Google Maps, I counted over 106 piers, jetties, landings yep. along that side of the river. A just on road. one side of the river? Just on yeah. the drift road just side. On that side. That's, that, that averages out to one dock pier landing uh, jetty every 200 feet. Wow. Is, is there some way that we could really lean on people to share a dock with our neighbors? I mean, look, here's a dock right next door to this. Authority. You see the one right next to it? We don't have the authority to do that? No. Could we zone? Mm, you might get into some jurisdictional area. Overlap with different state departments, you know, and, DP. And, and I would say that you know, in, in our neighborhood, we do share a dock. <laughs> <coughs> I share a dock with uh, my wife's cousin. So uh, that's that's what I you know I often said. You, you you drive Drift Road and you see from the street, you see 50 houses. You drive Drift Road from the water, you see 500. <laughs> Well, in a lot of talks I give, Mark, I say that the water's edge is where opportunity happens because whether people are coming from the water to land or land to water, they're always seeking opportunity. And therefore, the water's edge is the most valuable piece of real estate there is. And therefore, you take a straight line, roughly a straight line, which is the water's edge, and from the beginning, people have tried to take that straight line and maximize the water's edge by doing this, which is building piers. Yeah. Because that line 
makes it it's more longer, value longer, gets longer and longer <laughs> because that's valuable real estate. So you get peers and peers and peers. Dartmouth is holding a public hearing on April 1st. So this is, it's passed, but it's for their suite of amendments, zoning amendments that are going to go uh, to, to their town meeting. So, so this is this is a notification that, that we were reminded of, and, and um, our, our zoning decision last town meeting that we have an obligation to notify the neighboring towns about zoning changes. Mike, can you send an email out to me, please? Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Chairman, without trying to extend the. Uh, the meeting at all because uh, I have a, Wednesday is my day in Boston. But I get to get to early. Um, but in, in the light of uh, uh, my my colleague uh, Mr. Bullock's uh, comments, um, I don't think there is, is a need. I, I I I see the wisdom in his remarks about you know we don't need to underline the CRCs vote recommendations that, that uh, some of us participated in. Uh, the select board had it, and, 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 uh, and, 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 and the task, you know, I, I, I think we're, I, I think there is general agreement about the need for planning on, on West Beach, and to, and the idea of getting a CZM grant to have a management plan, have the, all the lot owners participate in that plan, so then we have a plan of this is what's going to happen. This is this is what the, you know the, the I'll say the intermediate chart. I think the long term plan is Mother Nature may take care of that for us, but 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 in the intermediate zone, let's get a plan that does that. So I think that there's that, and then. You know, the idea that I think with the information they have, this kind of immediate need of them making decisions about which permit to issue and mm -hmm. not issue, I think it's in good hands. And if they, they you know, I, I, you know, I, 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 I the select board, the select board manages the, the uh, highway department, they direct the highway department to do something, it's okay with me. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and, and I think we should. I think uh, John is right. You know, we don't. We don't need to select board are all intelligent people <coughs> can read. They can, We don't need to highlight that much. They can see what immediate action is necessary. And I think we should just in in our we we should make an agenda item as we as we have planning to, in time in our planning board meetings going forward. To, to think about the kind of steps and get the CZM grant application going and get you know get that plan in place and uh, and you know it's not only for this summer but it's for many summers in the future. Absolutely. So I am uh, persuaded by John's eloquent discussion. So I think that's. That's good. So we have the town of Dartmouth bylaw part of this. And then we have zoning board of appeals members. Expanding the outdoor seating area at the Bayside restaurant to include a non deck shelf area of approximately 1,800 square feet in front of the existing wooden deck. That's a good idea. They already have it? No, that hearing is on April 10th. Okay. okay. Another notification for 129 Sanford Road to convert an existing single family home into a detached one bedroom accessory apartment. That is on April 10th. And that's all. Okay. 
Uh, matters not reasonably anticipated? Hearing none, uh, we don't have a, a minutes, right? No. Okay. Then I would entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Aye.